Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge the Bidigal and Gadigal people who traditionally occupied the Sydney coast. We would also like to acknowledge Aboriginal elders, both past and present. My name is Elizabeth MacDonald and I work as a sustainable waste officer for Waverley Council here in Greater Sydney. This event is a New South Wales EPA Waste Less Recycle More initiative funded from the Waste Levy. Uh, this event is always very popular. We've run it a few times, today is no exception. Um, that might be something to do with us all being at home so much of the time these days. I'll be handing over shortly to Strata lawyer Amanda Farmer, who will lead today's session, which is all about how to combat bad behavior in apartment buildings using bylaws. So the goal of the session is to equip our Strata communities with tools and knowledge to be able to live in peace and harmony with our neighbors. Amanda is the owner of Lawyers Chambers, a Strata-focused legal practice here in Sydney. She's also the host of Your Strata Property podcast, an excellent podcast dedicated to exploring and explaining the legal complexities of Strata titled properties. She offers an online membership community for apartment owners and Strata managers seeking reliable information and resources for peaceful and profitable community living. With over 17 years experience in the Strata legal sector, Amanda is both a fellow and a council member of the Australian College of Strata Lawyers. She's also the founder of Women in Strata, a networking group for women working in strata management. She has been educating strata managers, apartment owners, and residents for many years through roundtable workshops, seminars, large-scale presentations, and guest speaking. She's presented webinars for the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales, presented at REI's annual Women in Real Estate Conference, presented for Strata Community Australia, New South Wales, and the Owners Corporation Network, as well as the Australian College of Strata Lawyers and numerous local councils, just like ours. So in short, she is extremely qualified to lead today's session. And not only is Amanda a Strata Law Specialist, she is also a local Strata owner here in Waverley. Uh, in 2019, just for some background, uh, Waverley Council asked Amanda to prepare a waste bylaw template that local strata committees could adopt and customize free of charge. So the template is a strong and comprehensive tool that can prevent and remedy waste related issues such as illegal dumping and contamination. This is caused by some bad behaviors of some residents. It's not your average waste bylaw. She'll go into more detail on this tool in today's session. But if you haven't already requested your copy of the bylaw, I highly encourage you to do so. And we will provide a link to where you can download this in our follow-up email for today's session. So without further ado, here is Amanda Farmer. Hello and welcome everybody. And thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Elizabeth. And thank you to Waverley Council for having me here today as your special guest to talk you through how we can use the power of bylaws to stamp out bad behavior in our apartment buildings and restore peace to our communities. Now I can see so, so many of you coming on in. You won't be able to see each other, but we can definitely see the names of the attendees coming in and we know that you're there. I am going to leave some time for questions in this session. We're due to wrap up at 1.30. So the questions will happen in the chat box. So I would love for you to make sure you have that chat box open and you know where it is and the way I know that you know that is you can pop me a hello in the chat box go ahead and type in the chat and say hi maybe let me know where you are today what suburb are you in I know we have lots of local Waverley Council residents we also have some others I'm seeing some familiar names there and I know you are coming from far and wide and it's just nice to connect, we are all locked down right across New South Wales and more broadly at the moment. And it's lovely to connect with each other here online. So let's say hi. Hi, Max, Gabby, hey, Paul, uh, Cliff Dog, g'day, cool name. Hey, Pauline, Alan is in Bondi, Paul is here from Coogee, Margaret is in Wagga, told you, far and wide, Mike's in Bondi, Tiago Bondi, Jeffrey from Paddington, hey, Jackie, Michael, Ene in Bronte, and in the Central Coast, cool, cool, Charles is locked in here in the inner west, Sam is in Randwick, Bronte yeah, is where Paul is, 
Fiona in King's Cross. Awesome. There are lots and lots of you, well over, I believe, 200 of you registered for today's session and uh, lots of you coming on in there. I can't get to all the highs, but I can see you all there. Lovely to see some familiar faces as well. I am going to head on over to my slides here and I am sincerely hoping that you can see me sharing that slide there. If not, then someone will pop in my ear and let me know. I am sure we are in for a fabulous 90 minutes or so together. You have heard that kind introduction from Elizabeth letting you know all about me if you haven't been on one of my webinars before. I am passionate about empowering strata owners with knowledge to make their experience of apartment living more peaceful and for our investors out there, more profitable. I am a strata owner and a tenant myself. I serve as secretary of a strata committee and I get it. This world of strata can be a little bit nuts, a little bit tough out there. We've got to have our flak jackets on. We've got to have our armor on. It is ever changing. It is always challenging. And it's my job to help you through the strata maze as painlessly as possible. And that's our aim here on today's webinar, as we talk about the incredible power that we have in our strata bylaws to make improvements to our communities that will impact and ultimately improve the way that we live. Now, today, this webinar is all about you. I want to congratulate you for taking the time out to be here today. I want you to know how much I admire you for investing this time and energy in your strata education. I respect how important and valuable your time is. I know it can take a lot to tear yourself away from other things that are vying for your attention right now in the middle of the day, even though we are locked down, locked in, many of us attending to homeschooling, I know at this point in time, I feel ya, I'm there with you. My commitment to you today is that I will give you valuable, relevant information that is worth the investment of your time. Now to help me do that, I'd love to know, a little bit more about you. Now, I am hopeful that I have, I do here have a poll for you, which I am going to launch right now. And I am hoping that you are seeing that poll up on your screen. We may have lost the slides in the background, but I'll get back to that. If you're not seeing that poll, just let me know if you can't see that on the screen. And you are going to choose, you can obviously see it because all those options are coming on in, those answers, the option that best describes you. You might fit into a couple of these, but I'd love for you to choose the one that best describes you. A committee member, a strata owner and resident, an owner but not a resident, so you're an investor, a strata manager, a tenant, a supplier to the strata sector. Have we missed you? Are you? Do you fall into that other category? I'm giving you 10 more seconds and then I'm going to end that poll and hopefully show you the results. Five more seconds, four, three, deadline dances here, two, one. Okay, the results of our poll. I am going to share those results. I'm hoping they're coming up there on the screen for you. 50% of you, half of you are strata committee members. That is not unusual. You are the highly engaged, the owners, the investors who want to do the best they can for their community, gaining this knowledge. Good on you. Strata owners and residents, nearly 30% of you. An owner, but not a resident. You're an investor, 6% of you. That's great. Strata managers, 7%. Awesome. You are more than welcome. So much helpful information here today. 3% tenants. Great. 3% uh, supplies. And we do have some others there. Pop in the chat what those others are. And uh, we'll see if we can pop a question in there for you for next time. Okay. Now I am going to stop sharing my screen to see if I can get my slides back. I'll close that poll that's in front of me here and we will jump back into it. I have lost my slides. One sec, getting them right back here for you. Excellent. Here we go. What can we expect today? We committee members, owners, residents, tenants, strata managers. What am I going to cover? I'm going to help you to understand if you don't yet which bylaws apply to your strata building. If you're not sure how to find out, I'm gonna let you know how you can do that. 
We're going to talk about this term harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. This is in our New South Wales legislation. They can be complex words. They're long words, a few syllables there. What do they mean? We can't have bylaws that are harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. They will be invalid. We have to be very careful of that. I'm going to walk you through some cases where bylaws have been invalidated because they are harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. What about when things go wrong? What can we do? How do we enforce our bylaws? How do we restore peace to our communities? We'll talk about that. I will give you some ideas for some great bylaws. I think great bylaws that I use, that my clients have been using and that you can take back to your communities. I will give you as much as I can in the short time that we have together. I will leave time for some Q&A over in that chat box at the end. You're welcome to pop your questions in uh, as we go. Uh, the chat box, I'm not looking at it right now, but I can see it flashing. So I know there's probably already some questions in there, but you might find that during today's session, I am answering your questions as I go along with the content that I have. So I will give you a heads up a few minutes before I'm gonna head into that chat box to look at the questions. So maybe hold off your questions until then. It'll be hopefully around 1 p.m., 10 past one when we get over to question time. We do have members of Waverley Council's Sustainable Waste Team here online. If you've got specific questions for council, particularly about waste and waste collection, do feel free to pop those in the chat. They can see your questions and I'm sure they will try to help you as best they can. I'm going to make sure that you finish up today with a far better understanding of the power that bylaws have to solve the wide range of problems we encounter as strata owners and residents. I'm also going to tell you how you can get your hands on a particular bylaw template that I have been working on with Waverley Council. You heard Elizabeth mention it earlier. It is going to speed you along your journey to an improved community, give you a head start. We've done the work for you. And as I said, I'm going to leave plenty of time to answer your questions right here live and do my best to support you in your strata experience. Sounds good? All righty, strap yourselves in. Here we go. Now, you heard Elizabeth say that I have been serving in this strata sector for 17 years, most of those years as a strata lawyer. And in that time, I have dealt with a wide range, wide and continuing consistent range of difficult behaviours and difficult residents. Yes, I've had the criminals, the uh, drug dealers, the bikies, those wanted by police harassing the residents, giving the poor strata manager a tough time at meetings. They've been difficult personalities. The illegal renovations, the work that is done without first seeking approval, without proposing a bylaw, and perhaps without complying with a bylaw that might be in place, causing water penetration, causing leaky bathrooms, causing damp ceilings and causing much distress to other residents. I've definitely dealt with those situations. Dumping of rubbish on the common property, dumping on council's land, not complying with directions for the removal of waste, I've dealt with that, uh, all the way to unpaid levies and increased expenses for owners' corporations when they are attempting to deal with breaches of the bylaws, deal with breaches of the legislation. Now, wide range of problems, how have those been dealt with? How have those been solved by me and by my clients over the years? Well, I can tell you in every one of those situations, my first port of call, my first stop always is the bylaws. A building's bylaws are incredibly powerful when it comes to solving these problems and even preventing them. And that's where I want to get you to today. I have that big book there. Um, hoping your bylaws don't look like that. I know a lot of you, they are definitely getting there. We strata lawyers like to draft lengthy bylaws, that's for sure. But that is because they are such fascinating instruments. Here we have the power invested in our private citizens to actually regulate the activities of other private citizens. That is just mind-blowing. It doesn't happen in other areas of our law. So it's very powerful. Uh, 
but we need to make sure we are using that power properly and for the benefit of our residents and our community as a whole. How do you know which bylaws apply in your building? What I'm showing you on the screen here is what we call a certificate of title. This is actually about to become a bit of an historical artifact. We have new law that has just started very recently in our state where these certificates of title will be no more because everything is going to an electronic version. So you won't actually have a hard copy of this document very soon. Uh, it will all be online. But when you have a look at this online, this is pretty much what it looks like. This is the certificate of title for your common property. Now, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but in the top right corner, we can see CP, that stands for common property, and SP, that is strata plan, and then you will see your strata plan number. So this is the title that confirms that the common property is owned by the owners corporation, the owners of strata plan number in the first schedule there. And this is where we have to look to get a copy of our bylaws. I have box there in red where you will see on the certificate of title or when you do a title search online where you will see your consolidation of registered bylaws. And you'll see a number next to those words. That is what we call your dealing number. If you have that number, then you can get a copy of all of your bylaws in a consolidated bundle. When we got our 2015 Strata Schemes Management Act, which started in November 2016, all owners corporations had an obligation to keep a consolidated up-to-date copy of the bylaws. And whenever the bylaws are changed, added to, amended, repealed, we have to let the land titles office know and we register a new consolidation of registered bylaws. So when you see that on your title and you have that dealing number, you can obtain a copy of that consolidation. Some of you may be asking, but how? How do I do that? If you have a strata manager, then absolutely the first person to talk to about getting a copy of your bylaws is your strata manager. They should be able to give you quite quickly, uh, email to you a copy of the consolidated registered bylaws. If you don't have a strata manager or your strata manager isn't able for whatever reason to give you the bylaws, then I'm going to show you where you can go to get your copy. Head over to this website. The, the, these are the Registrar General's Guidelines. It's a division within Land Registry Services. That is the URL there. Uh, I'm putting Pia on the spot here. Uh, Pia is helping me out here in the background. If you do have that link, Pia, or you can grab it for me, just pop it in the chat here for our attendees to have a copy of. Head over to the Registrar General's Guidelines. In the left-hand side, you'll see a section there for strata scheme questions. Lots of helpful information over there. In particular, where can I find the bylaws? And if you read through that page, it describes to you if your strata plan was registered at different times uh, in the cycle of our strata legislation. You might be in a new building, you might be in, old, in an older building, uh, where you can find your bylaws, what they might look like, and ultimately how you can get a copy of the dealing if you find out what your consolidated bundle of bylaws, what the dealing number is for your consolidated bundle of bylaws, you can order that through the uh, land registry services. And that website will help you find an online agent who can then get that copy of the bylaws for you. So it's really important if we're talking about the power that we have within our bylaws to regulate our communities, that we know what bylaws we have in place. Some people are surprised sometimes. They think they had a bylaw dealing with rubbish and waste management, they don't actually have one, or they think it says something, but it doesn't say what it needs to say. Our starting point is always to make sure we're aware of what our current bylaws are. Alrighty, let's talk about some bad bylaws, some bylaws that we shouldn't have, in my view, in place in our owners corporations within our strata schemes. When you've got that consolidated bundle, you want to be looking through and making sure your bylaws don't fall foul of this legislation, which is section 139 of the Strata Schemes Management Act. We can't have bylaws that are harsh unconscionable or oppressive. I will tell you a little bit more about what those terms mean and how they are being applied in practice. 
We can't have bylaws that prevent the transfer, leasing, mortgage or other dealing relating to a lot. So we can't stop people or certain types of people from buying or selling. I get asked that a lot. We can't uh, force somebody to sell or to move out. We can't stop tenants. Uh, I do have buildings asking about that. Can we have a no tenants, uh, a bylaw that says no tenants? No, that is illegal. It's against section 139. Uh, we can't stop uh, anything that deals with mortgages in our bylaws. So it kind of feels like common sense, but do, I do get these questions and this is why we can't do these things. We can't have bylaws that restrict children from occupying a lot. That is, of course, uh, excluding our over 55s developments that are specifically approved for that purpose by the local council. We can't have bylaws that prevent assistance animals. And that is the term in our legislation. It used to say guide dogs. It now says assistance animals. And yes, some of you might be saying, Amanda, hasn't there been a lot going on with the law when it comes to the keeping of pets? And aren't there some other new rules that have come into play very, very recently? Yes, there are. And I am going to share a little bit about what's going on with our legislation and the keeping of pets in our strata schemes. We can't have bylaws that are inconsistent with the Strata Schemes Management Act or any other law. That's actually in section 136, not in 139. We can't have bylaws that are inconsistent with a community management statement. So some of you tuning in may live in large communities where there are a number of strata schemes and an overarching community association. If that's you, then you've got your strata schemes bylaws, your owners corporation bylaws, but you've also got the community associations bylaws and they are set out in the community management statement, the CMS. We love our acronyms here in strata. So you need to make sure that as well as being across your strata scheme bylaws, you are also across the bylaws in your community management statement because if there's an inconsistency, the community management statement will prevail. Uh, we definitely see that when it comes to pets in particular, where the community association might say no pets and your owner's corporation has a bylaw that says pets are fine. The community association's bylaw will prevail. What does this term, harsh, unconscionable or oppressive actually mean? And it's okay if you feel a little bit like that when you're hearing those words. We lawyers felt the same a few years ago when these words first came in. What does that mean? How is that going to be applied? Helpfully, over the last five or six years, we have seen these terms tested in a few cases, probably not as many as I would have expected, but a few cases before our tribunal, the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, also known as NCAT, and we have seen bylaws tested against this rule that they cannot be harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. We've also seen some cases in our courts, in our Supreme Court. And I'm going to share three of those cases with you today. I think they're good examples of what we need to look out for when we are looking at our bylaws. The case of SIC, this is a case where a bylaw was banning what a local council otherwise permitted. What happened to that bylaw? We will find out. The case of Garam, a bylaw that was banning hard flooring in the building. Was that bylaw legal? Let's see. And the case of Cooper, a bylaw that was banning pets, a blanket ban on pets. How did that one turn out? If you are up to date on the media, if you read the uh, Sydney Morning Herald, you might be able to answer that one. There's been a lot of media about that the last week or so, uh, and certainly the last few months. Let's get into the sick case. This case uh, always sticks in my mind because it's a case about an unusual commercial lot. This commercial lot has a swimming pool in it. It's not the common property swimming pool. It's actually within the lot. It is the property of the commercial lot owner. And of course, if you've got one of those, what do you want to do? If you're running a business, you want to operate a swimming school. Now, this uh, owner's corporation, this building had a bylaw in place that actually said the commercial lot in particular cannot be used 
as a swimming school. Uh, there were a number of restrictions on how the lot could be used and, and swimming pool was one of those restrictions. Now, understandably, the commercial owner was frustrated by that. They had been to the local council. They already had development consent from the local council to run their swimming school, to use the lot for that purpose. The only thing that was stopping them from using the lot for that purpose was this bylaw. So the bylaw allowed a commercial use of lot 51, but it specifically excluded a swimming school among other uses. The owner took the owner's corporation to the tribunal, said, I think your bylaw is invalid. And the tribunal agreed with the owner. The bylaw prohibits a use that is otherwise permitted by the council with consent. The bylaw is therefore invalid because it is harsh, unconscionable, or oppressive. So we want to be very careful about telling owners that they cannot do things that the council otherwise says are just fine to do within the building, even if the council says you need development consent. As long as the owner has that development consent to use their property as they'd like, then I think a bylaw that is going to be preventing owners from that use is going to be a bylaw that could be successfully challenged. And I'm very interested to see if we see more of these types of cases cropping up as we see more people working from home, wanting to use their apartments, use their homes in different ways, uh, perhaps a little more than a home office, uh, perhaps some more business use going on, approaching the local council. Maybe that's something that's permitted in that particular local government area. Maybe it's not. And seeing how owners corporations may attempt to deal with these situations by way of bylaw. Always bear in mind that swimming pool case that Amanda talked about and make sure you don't fall foul of the law there when you are drafting your bylaws, attempting to regulate that activity. Uh, I always like to say, let's start from a place of regulating rather than banning. And you'll hear me talk about that when we talk about pets. It's a much safer place to be, I think, for owners' corporations when they're drafting their bylaws. The Garam case, this was a case about hard flooring. Fairly basic bylaw. You can see it there on the screen. No hard flooring, such as timber or ceramic floor tiles, is permitted to be installed in any of the lots in the strata plan, except for the ground floor units. This bylaw does not apply to floor space comprising a kitchen, laundry, lavatory, or bathroom. Very standard. These are bylaws that I was drafting when I was a, a junior, a baby strata lawyer. I was doing a lot of bylaws banning hard flooring in buildings, quite popular. This bylaw was in place in this strata plan, and the lot owner, uh, Garam, wanted to challenge that bylaw because they wanted nice new floating floor. And they had approached the, tribe, uh, approached the owners corporation seeking approval for that floor. The owners corporation said, can't have it. We have a bylaw that says no hard floors anywhere in our building. So the owner went off to the tribunal, said that doesn't sound right. It doesn't really seem fair. And the owner pointed in particular to a section of our legislation, section 110 in the Strata Schemes Management Act. This is a section about minor works or minor renovations. And it's the section that tells us that minor renovations are permitted in a building, an owner can carry out minor renovations as long as they have the approval of the owner's corporation. How do they get that approval? They just need an ordinary resolution at a general meeting. And if the owner's corporation has delegated that task to the strata committee, as many of your buildings will have done, then they can simply get approval for minor renovations from the strata committee. So Garam thought, well, these are minor works, I think, and I should, the legislation says that I should be able to get approval for these works, either from the owner's corporation in general meeting or from the strata committee. Uh, I've had a look at section 110. It lists the types of minor works uh, the types of renovations that constitute minor works. And I've got them here on the screen for you. Renovating a kitchen is minor work, changing recessed light fittings, installing or replacing wood or other hard floors. That's where Garan was coming from. Wiring, cabling, power access points, reconfiguring walls, interestingly, removing carpet to expose hard floors, installing a rainwater tank, a clothesline. Just be aware that this, not all of this is in section 110. I've drawn some of it from regulation 28 also. This section cross refers 
to Regulation 28. So if you're looking for what constitutes minor works, have a look at Section 110 and also Regulation 28. But I've highlighted here for you, for the purposes of this case, installing or replacing wood or other hard floors is minor work. It's allowed. It's allowed under the legislation. So Garam went to the tribunal and said, if it's allowed under the legislation, how can the owners corporation have a bylaw that prevents it? Isn't that harsh, unconscionable or oppressive? And the tribunal agreed. The tribunal said, yes, uh, this bylaw that bans hard flooring is harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. Also, it is a bylaw that conflicts with the legislation. And if you remember back to that earlier slide when I was looking at section 136, we cannot have a bylaw that conflicts with the Strata Schemes Management Act. So if the act says you can do it and you have a bylaw that says you can't do it or you can't do it in the same way that the act allows you to do it, I think you're going to have a problem and your bylaw is very likely to be open to successful challenge. So be careful if you have uh, these bans on hard flooring. I have acted for many clients in recent years challenging those bans, successfully challenging those bans. We don't make it to the tribunal because we already have this authority from Garam, which when I fill the building in, that they are likely to be unsuccessful in defending the application. They go ahead and amend their bylaw to permit hard flooring. We're seeing more of these as we see people uh, aging in place and needing to have uh, their apartments modified to allow for things like wheelchairs, perhaps uh, people with medical issues that can't have carpet and must have hard floors, perhaps because of allergies. Um, we're seeing these challenges to bylaws relating to bans on hard floors. Um, just have a look at that long list. These are all things that the legislation says owners can have. They can do this work as long as they have approval. So having in place an approval process rather than a ban is really the direction that you want to go in. What is it that owners need to do to apply to the strata committee to get approval for their minor renovation? And what power does the strata committee have to impose conditions on the carrying out of that work to ensure that it's done in a way that protects the building and causes least disturbance to other occupiers. You can have all of that set out in a bylaw. I call it a renovation works bylaw that sets out the steps to be followed by owners who want to carry out any kind of renovation, including a minor works renovation. Let's talk about pets. This is the Cooper case. There is the uh, citation, as we call it, as lawyers up there on your screen, Cooper and the owners of Strata Plan number 58068. This is a case heard by the New South Wales Court of Appeal, the highest court in our state, heard in, uh, well, the judgment was delivered in October 2020, and it came after some conflicting judgments from our tribunal, a judgment in favour of Ms Cooper in the lower level of the tribunal, a judgment then against Ms Cooper by the appeal panel, and then this judgment of the Court of Appeal in favour of Ms Cooper. And if you haven't heard, uh, what Ms Cooper was trying to do was overturn a complete ban on pets, which her building, the Horizon building in Sydney's Darlinghurst, her building had a complete ban on pets and she wished to legally keep her miniature schnauzer Angus in her apartment. Now, this case is so important because not only does it give us some law on what the keep, what building should be doing when it comes to residents keeping pets, but it also tells us a bit about what it is that makes a bylaw harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. It gives us some general rules. And coming from the highest court in our state, these are important rules, rules that we should pay attention to. They will be binding uh, on the tribunal being a lower level of our judicial system. So the Court of Appeal in Cooper said that a blanket ban may be harsh, unconscionable or oppressive. That was in particular a blanket ban on pets. In my view, the reasoning of the court can be extended to relate to blanket bans on pretty much anything, uh, particularly if the legislation permits it, doesn't otherwise uh, prohibit it. Blanket banning anything is dangerous. 
The court said it doesn't matter what knowledge the owner had when they bought in. There was uh, an argument uh, by the Horizon building that Ms. Cooper had bought in knowing that there was a ban on pets. The Court of Appeal said bylaws can be changed. They have always been able to be changed. They are changed by a special resolution at a general meeting. So no owner should ever rely on the bylaws remaining the same in their building from the time they bought in. Bylaws are fluid. They are changing the processes in the legislation for them to change. So it is not uh, good enough to say to an owner, well, that's how it was when you bought in, you should suck it up and deal with it. The court said that a bylaw should have a rational connection with the enjoyment of other lots and the common property. Really important. That's one of those general statements, a principle, that general rule that I was talking about earlier. That's not just pet bylaws, all bylaws should have a rational connection with the enjoyment of other lots and the common property. That's a really good test to hold your bylaws up against. Is, does this bylaw have something to do with the enjoyment of lots and the common property. What job is this bylaw doing? Is it protecting the enjoyment of lots and the common property? A bylaw that restricts residence activities with no rational connection to the enjoyment of other lots and the common property will be beyond power. Regulating for the sake of regulating. Regulating because it makes it easy for the strata committee to just ban something rather than have to engage in a process of assessing it, of considering whether this particular owner with this particular pet in this particular building, whether it's reasonable for that person to actually have a pet that has no impact whatsoever on other lots in the common property. The Horizon Building said one of the reasons they have a ban is to ensure administrative convenience for their strata committee. And the court said, sorry, not good enough. I know you're busy. I know you're volunteers, but you actually have to engage with these applications. You have to think about how an activity, whether it's a renovation or whether it is uh, the keeping of a pet, how is that going to impact others? And if there is uh, a way that you can regulate that impact that does not constitute banning the activity altogether, then that's the path that you should be going down. Uh, there's that point there about administrative convenience. It doesn't make a bylaw valid. And ultimately, the Horizons blanket ban on the keeping of animals was found to be oppressive because it prohibits an ordinary incident of the ownership of real property, namely keeping a pet animal. That's interesting. Keeping a pet is an ordinary incident of the ownership of real property. It's like a property right. The bylaw provides no material benefit to other occupiers. A bit controversial for some, perhaps. Essentially, the court found that you can be regulating the outcome of keeping an animal. You can deal with the noise. You can deal with the potential damage. You can deal with the behavior by other means deal with it in other bylaws. We have nuisance provisions in our legislation. We have a provision in our legislation where a pet can be removed by order of the tribunal if it's not, if it's causing a nuisance within the community. A ban is not the answer, is the message that comes out of Cooper. Now, this decision uh, came, um, came out to much uh, media and a bit of confusion about where this now leaves our bylaws that deal with, with pets. And I'm very conscious that this is not a webinar about pets, but I get so many questions about this. I did want to let you know that we do have some new legislation, which just started last Wednesday, the 25th of August, which clarifies some of these principles from Cooper. It's really important that if pets is an issue in your building or an owner is wanting to keep a pet, if you have a ban in place, if you want to go and investigate this issue further, you do have a look at our new section, brand new, shiny new section in the Strata Schemes Management Act, which says that a bylaw has no force or effect to the extent that it unreasonably prohibits the keeping of an animal on a lot. The section also says it is reasonable to keep an animal unless the keeping of the animal unreasonably interferes with another occupant's use and enjoyment of the occupant's lot or the common property. Of course, the question that arises, Amanda, what does unreasonably interfere mean? What, how is that going to be applied? What is unreasonable interference? Helpfully also, as of last week, we have a new regulation Regulation 36A in our Strata Schemes Management Regulation, which gives us some of these circumstances of unreasonable interference. And they are summarized here for you. If the animal creates a persistent noise, 
the animal repeatedly runs at or chases another occupier, a visitor or another animal. If the animal attacks a person or another animal, causes damage to the common property, endangers the health of others, has an offensive odor. All of these things are in regulation 36A. These are examples of unreasonable interference. And I am now saying that if you have a bylaw that regulates the keeping of animals, you must be incorporating these circumstances into your bylaw. Have a look at 137B, have a look at 36A and make sure your keeping of pets bylaws reflect the terms of this legislation. If you want to find out more about this new law, my views on this new law, how it impacts bylaws that deal with the weight limit, weights, you know, no dogs over 15 kilos, bylaws that limit numbers, no more than two dogs, for example. I talk about all of that in last week's podcast episode, number 276. Does your pet bylaw stack up? And Pia has a link there that she can pop in the notes for you so you can check that one out later. All right, moving right along, away from one of my favorite topics, pets. What happens when things go wrong with these bylaws? We have our bylaws in place. We know what they are. We have worked hard to get some good bylaws in place. And I'm going to come to my list of recommended bylaws for you. We need to, we have a resident who is breaching the bylaws and we need to enforce the bylaws. What's the best way to go about that? It's probably not hiring one of these guys to go door knocking for you. That is not something that I recommend. There is a two-step process, if you like. First of all, issuing a notice to comply and proceeding to seek a penalty order from the tribunal. That's one of the steps in the process. Secondly, applying for mediation and then seeking tribunal orders for compliance. Now, I say this is a two-step process. I don't say one or the other because you can actually, in some circumstances, do both of these things at the same time. In some really difficult circumstances, that's what I recommend to my clients, that we do both of these things at the same time. In other circumstances, just this option one, a notice to comply on a penalty order is your best bet. Those types of circumstances are where we have um, events such as noise, noise complaints, noise dispute, bad behavior, on the common property, uh, people harassing, threatening, intimidating, perhaps on the common property, not complying with our model bylaw six about behavior, which I'm going to remind you about later. The kinds of situations where you want to send a message, send a message to the resident. And if your bylaw is uh, creatively drafted, you can send this message to the owner as well as the resident if they're two different people, that this type of behavior, this noise, uh, the way that the rubbish room is dealt with, the garbage room or the uh, bin room, the garbage chute that you might be lucky enough to have on each floor of your building, the way that that is being dealt with is not on this uh, failure to meet community scan standards is not on. And if the resident is going to continue to behave that way, then they will have to pay a penalty. They will have to pay a fine. That's your step one process. You want to send a message. You want to essentially uh, penalize the resident for their bad behavior in the hope that it will not happen again. The second process, mediation and seeking tribunal orders, this is really important where you want the resident to actually do something. You need an order that they fix damage to common property, for example. You need an order that they uh, comply with the renovation works bylaw that was made for them because they haven't done their renovation in accordance with the approved terms. When you actually need them to take active steps to do something, to correct the problem or to improve their behavior, then you need to take the step two process. You apply for mediation, then you seek specific tribunal orders that tell them what to do. So I hope that distinction uh, is clear for you. If it's not, do pop in the chat and I can go over that again during our question time. Uh, the notice to comply process, it is a technical one. So the example I want to use is we have uh, neighbours upstairs who are causing unacceptable levels of noise. The resident below, their peaceful enjoyment is unreasonably 
disturbed and the residents upstairs are just not improving. They've had a knock on the door. They've been told, hey, 2 a.m. blaring music is not, not on. Uh, this is not, we understand everybody's at home all of the time now, but we might put up with some music till 10 p.m. But 2 a.m. being woken up is not what we should be putting up with in our communities. So that hasn't worked. The behavior is continuing. The uh, Strata Committee decides to issue a formal notice to comply. There are very strict requirements for a notice to comply to be valid. You need to have a look at section 146 of the Strata Schemes Management Act that tells you what needs to be in the form. If you've got a strata manager, you should be enlisting their assistance with this. Sometimes they choose to enlist the assistance of a strata lawyer. Uh, it's really important that before you issue a notice to comply, the strata manager has delegated authority under their agency agreement to issue that notice or there has been a strata committee resolution authorizing the issue of that notice. Legislation requires that type of authority. I have seen notices to comply thrown out by the tribunal or later penalty applications thrown out by the tribunal because this process wasn't followed properly. And the notice to comply needs to be properly served on the resident. We need to fill in an affidavit of service confirming how we issued that notice. So you issue the notice to comply, of course, it sets out the bylaw that is being breached. And if there is still no compliance, the noise upstairs is continuing. It is open to the owners corporation to proceed to the tribunal and seek a penalty order. And the penalty is a payment of money of up to $1,100. If there is a second breach of the same bylaw within 12 months of a first penalty being imposed, the penalty doubles to up to $2,200. The money is payable to the owner's corporation. And if the money isn't paid and the resident is in breach of the tribunal's order to pay the money, then the fine can increase up to $5,500 because that is the fine for a breach of a tribunal order. And you can recover um, that money as if it was an unpaid levy. Uh, this is new legislation that's just started within the last month in our Strata Schemes Management Act. Breach of orders attract a fine of up to $5,500. I know a lot of buildings who, have got, who are going to be tapping into that one. Uh, this is why it's very important to be consistent in your approach to bylaw breaches because you have this process of a fine at $1,100. Someone might say, oh, well, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, but a second breach within 12 months, that fine doubles. And if your bylaw is drafted in such a way that both the resident and the owner are responsible for bylaw breaches, then a landlord owner who is facing penalties that are up to this amount regularly because of a recalcitrant tenant is going to get pretty tired of that tenant pretty quickly and you're going to see leases finally being terminated or importantly not renewed. So it's definitely worth putting in this effort to following this enforcement process, issuing those formal notices. If your uh, knock on the door and perhaps an informal letter has failed, remember you have this open to you. The second uh, method I spoke about earlier, the tribunal application, we want our resident, our recalcitrant resident to do something to fix the common property, to reinstate the dam, to fix the damage they've done, to reinstate common property that they've impacted by an illegal renovation, some kind of illegal work. We must start this process with mediation. That is a mandatory prerequisite before we file our tribunal application. Once we've done that, if mediation is not successful, we proceed with an application for an order of the tribunal. Really important, this application is properly prepared. You need evidence proving how the bylaw has been breached, what the bylaw is, what the owner has or hasn't done to breach the bylaw. Photographs, of course, uh, video evidence these days is great. If you have CCTV, that's fabulous. Lawyers love that. Don't forget if you are commencing legal proceedings and especially if you are engaging a lawyer and spending money on lawyers, you must have a general meeting resolution approving the commencement of the proceedings and approving the expenditure on lawyers. The committee can only approve up to $3,000 to spend on lawyers without an ordinary resolution of the general meeting. If the case is urgent, they can spend up to $15,000, but I always recommend to my committees that they get 
the motion before the general meeting to approve expenditure on lawyers ASAP. We're all pretty good at having our online meetings these days. So I am seeing those motions go through fairly promptly. Little flow chart there for you, an enforcement process. I spoke earlier about a knock on the door. Sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes it's not. Uh, I have found that successful myself when dealing with noise issues. Yes, I have got out there in my PJs at 2 a.m. and knocked on the neighbor's door and said, guys, and it's often guys, boys, it's not on. And I have seen the behavior improve definitely by having that conversation and perhaps having another calmer conversation in the morning. A written communication, and I just want to say sometimes that is not appropriate, of course, if there is some fear for safety, uh, there has been some threats or some harassment, then absolutely you need to protect your safety first and foremost. Uh, a written communication, not quite the level of the notice to comply, but perhaps a formal letter from the strata manager setting out the breach of the bylaw. The resident may not be aware that there is a bylaw about how we deal with the rubbish room and may not be aware that they are in breach of it and exposing themselves and maybe their landlord to a penalty order. So a warning about that can be helpful that doesn't work, we might proceed to number three there, the notice to comply and or mediation. You might do both of these at the same time. Um, you don't have to mediate before issuing a notice to comply or before seeking a penalty order, but you can, might be helpful. You do have to mediate if you are seeking ultimately a tribunal order uh, that, the owner's called, that the owner who's in breach actually does something. Uh, and follow through the process there for your tribunal order application or your penalty order application. Uh, indeed, if there is uh, a need to act urgently, then your knock on the door or your informal written communication is not going to be appropriate. If there's work that has started that is illegal or that is not being done in accordance with an approved bylaw, the method that's set out in the bylaw, it's incredibly important you move quickly before that work continues or is indeed completed. And you might have to do that by making an urgent application to the tribunal. It's quite hard to get work undone once it is done, uh, but if you can get a stop work order urgently from the tribunal to preserve the status quo, you're going to be in a much stronger position to argue the case before the tribunal that the work, uh, the effect to common property needs to be reinstated or the work needs to be done properly. Okay, a list of useful bylaws. I promised these to you that I would let you know what I think are helpful bylaws that I think you should have on your books at the moment as owners corporations, as committee members. A bylaw that allows you to recover expenses. So when I say expenses, there are costs associated with enforcing our bylaws. It costs us some money as an owner's corporation when our strata manager sends a letter to a recalcitrant resident. It might be about 150 bucks for the strata manager to send that letter. Uh, can we recover that? cost from the owner who is in breach of the bylaws, who's the cause of this cost. Our legislation doesn't allow us or doesn't give us this power, this authority to recover such costs, but the lawyers, strata lawyers uh, are quite confident and we do have a couple of cases that have supported us in saying that if you have a bylaw that empowers you to recover these kinds of costs, these kinds of expenses from owners, then it is legal to be recovering them. But you have to have a bylaw in place. If you don't have that bylaw in place, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, I see these kinds of bylaws quite helpful when there's a false fire alarm. False fire alarm and the call out of the fire brigade can be quite expensive for owners corporations. I think it might be close to $2,000 now that the fire brigade charges to come out. If you can track back that false fire alarm to the behavior of a particular resident, uh, then you can charge that cost back to that the owner of that lot if you have a bylaw, if you have a bylaw in place that allows you to do it. I mentioned this earlier, a bylaw that deals with renovation works. What is the process if an owner wants to do cosmetic work, minor work, major work? We have these different tiers of renovation works in our strata schemes. It is a great idea to have a bylaw that sets all of that out so you can hand it over to a renovation happy owner and say, here's the process, follow that process. You'll ultimately get your application before the committee It will have all of the things in it that it needs to have for the committee to consider the application and impose any reasonable conditions on the approval of the work. A bylaw for moving in and moving out for new tenants. What is it that they have to do? Who do they have to connect with? Who do they have to let know that they're there? Um, this is a really important 
bylaw that contains a, an induction process. It gives your committee, uh, your resident owners, if they're there and able to meet with the tenant, the opportunity to explain to the tenant what the standards of the community are, where the bin room is, where the recycling bins are, what the process is, when they empty all those boxes, do, can they call council and get a private collection booked in for them? How do they do that? It gives you that point of contact if you have a process for moving in and moving out of new tenants and being notified when someone is moving out is incredibly important so that once again, you can have that regime in place to make sure we don't have dumping, we don't have rubbish left on the common property or on council land. I know that very often, 90% of the time, we are just not told when people are coming in and when they're moving out. It is a requirement in our legislation that landlords let owners corporations know about new tenants. Um, nobody reads the legislation. Why don't we put it into a bylaw and make it a more user-friendly, understandable process? A bylaw about waste disposal. I'm gonna come back to this very, very shortly, give you a little bit more detail on what I've been working on with Waverley. A bylaw about smoking. These are more and more popular. Also, some buildings are banning smoking altogether within lots and on the common property. They're doing that by way of bylaw. These kinds of bylaws have been upheld by our tribunal and by our courts. Remember, bylaws are about benefiting for the benefit of occupants in their use and enjoyment of lots and common property. This is a good example, I think, of a bylaw that goes to exactly that principle, uh, meets those principles in Cooper. Uh, and I'd be very interested to see now um, whether there would be any successful challenge to those kinds of bylaws. Um, lots of buildings finding those ones helpful and putting those in place. Bylaw about animals, you've got to revisit those pets, keeping of pets, keeping of animals bylaws in light of our new legislation I spoke about earlier. Uh, and short term letting, we have a lot of changes in that area as well. At the moment, we do have a section in our Strata Schemes Management Act, section 137A, that allows us to put in place a bylaw restricting investor owners from short term letting where it is not the owner's principal place of residence, then they are not allowed to short-term let. You can make a bylaw that says that. So if that's something that is of interest to you in your building, make sure you consider getting in place a short-term letting bylaw. Okay. I've mentioned to you the importance of and my recommendation that you have in place a waste bylaw, a waste disposal bylaw. Now more so, than ever before. This is a very recent photo that was in our media uh, just a couple of weeks ago of somebody's been ruined during lockdown. We have more people at home than ever before, all at the same time, living, working, and I know our bin rooms, our garbage rooms, our shoot rooms are overflowing. Everybody is struggling. What's more, we have restrictions on workers leaving the hotspot LGAs for work. Cleaners of residential strata properties are not authorized workers, so they cannot be leaving those LGAs, which seem to be growing by the week, to go out and clean apartment buildings. And I know it is causing a huge problem. We have had a surge. These are just some headlines that I pulled out of media recently. Waste surges due to COVID cleanouts. Everybody's getting a bit Marie Kondo out there and dumping their unwanted items in our common property bins and bin rooms. Australian households have thrown out more than 10% more rubbish and recyclables via curbside bins during the lockdown amid a spike in supermarket shopping and home deliveries. And there's even some PhD research on the increasing demand for PPE and why incorrect waste management and disposal is potentially just as much a threat to our health as the virus itself. Wowie. This is a photo that was sent to me by a client a little while ago. This was not during lockdown. This was uh, prior to when we were all still free, prior to the most recent lockdown. And the client said to me, Amanda, this is a regular Saturday afternoon in our community. Very large community, lots of move in, lots of move out. This is actually their bin area. And this is what happens with people moving in and moving out over a weekend. A really, really serious problem. 
It is something that councils uh, across the state have been recognizing as they all work towards a zero waste future and have worked together with me to tap into the power of bylaws to attempt to regulate better how we deal with waste disposal within our strata schemes. Now, I am actually going to not just show you that because I've got a bit more here for you today. I'm going to give you a little sneak peek into a copy of the bylaw itself. I'm just going to reshare here. I've just seen that chat box. That is crazy, guys. I will, <laughs> I will get over there shortly. Now, what I hope you are seeing there on the screen is the cover page for our template waste disposal bylaw. If you are a resident in the Waverley local government area, we're going to let you know how you can get your hands on exactly this document. You can see that it is a Word document, exactly this document, uh, so that you can implement this bylaw in your strata scheme. We have, I'm just going to scroll through rather promptly, we have on page two some instructions for how you incorporate the bylaw so that it meets your building's requirements and how you adopt it by way of special resolution. And I am at risk of making you seasick, going to scroll on down to a couple of key points I wanted to highlight here in the document. The bylaw, the clause, there are clauses here in the bylaw that make owners and occupiers responsible for their visitors and their invitees, those who are attending. If you have it in a bylaw, you can enforce it, okay? I spoke about a move in, move out bylaw. I've put one in here for you. The induction process for occupiers, that is here in the bylaw. So you don't have to worry about having that separate move in, move out bylaw if you are keen on regulating waste management. We're making non-resident owners responsible here for notifying the owners corporation what's going on with their tenants. We're dealing with costs and we're making owners liable for the actions of their occupier. Really, really important things that if you have a waste bylaw already in place, Many of you will, there's a model bylaw in our legislation dealing with waste management. And you may say, Amanda, we've already got one, we already deal with it. Does it have those extra special clauses that are going to help you be so much more powerful when it comes to regulating this kind of behavior? This is a bylaw that I have worked on, not just with Waverley, but with City of Sydney Council, many, many councils right across New South Wales. And it has gradually been improved over all of that time, addressing the specific concerns that residents are raising with their councils. Now I can see some uh, people putting hands up there. I'm not responding to hands up. If you have a question, pop it into the chat and I'm gonna head over to that chat box very, very soon. Okay, we will for now head back to the slides. If I can retrieve those, just bear with me. Okay. So that's a sneak peek at our template. A little summary here for what is in it in case you were a bit seasick and didn't catch all of that. We have the rules for waste disposal, what things go in what bins. The bylaw requires the residents to follow the rules. If it's not in a bylaw, you can't follow that enforcement process. You can't issue that notice to comply. You can't recover that penalty. Put it in the bylaw, you're gonna give yourselves more options. The bylaw says you must comply. Residents must comply with building directions and council guidelines. The bylaw talks about designated areas for different types of rubbish. How to notify about lost or damaged bins. What are the rules for bulky waste collection, including how you can book that? How do, do residents have the number they need to book in their waste collection? There's that all important induction procedure for new tenants and the bylaws making owners responsible for occupiers and visitors and allowing the owners corporation to recover those expenses from owners. If there is an expense, if there is a fine, if there is a fee that the owner's corporation has to, play, to pay, it can be sheeted home to the owner. Remember, if we don't have a bylaw, we can't recover those expenses. Do you want the template bylaw for free? Do you? I think you might. If you're a Waverley Council resident, then you need to go to this website and Pia has that ready for you in the chat box, waverley.nsw.gov.au forward slash waste bylaw. You'll see there, there's a form for you to fill out. You have to explain where you are, your address, and uh, the Waverley Council officers will be able to assess that application for you and get you exactly a copy of that Word document that I showed you today. If you are not a resident of Waverley Council, then drop me an email. I have worked with uh, close to 50 councils now, I think, over the last 
couple of years, uh, helping to establish and to deliver this template bylaw out to their community. So it's very possible that I have worked with or I'm about to work with your council. So drop me an email, amanda at yourstrataproperty.com.au. All right, I wanna cover two more issues before I head over to that chat box. This is your heads up, five minute warning. Five minute warning, I'm gonna head over to that chat box. If you want to inundate me any further, with questions. I'm seeing lots and lots flashing at me there. I mentioned this earlier, model bylaw six. I love this bylaw. I, it never ceases to amaze me how many communities forget that they have it in place. We've all got it. It's an old model bylaw about behavior. An owner or occupier of a lot when on common property must be adequately clothed, must not use language or behave in a manner likely to cause offense or embarrassment to the owner or occupier of another lot or another person lawfully using the common property. That would include tradespeople. I know in some very um, unhappy communities, there are particular residents who cause trouble, cause trouble with trades, cause trouble on site with building managers, are difficult on the common property. This is your bylaw. This is your all encompassing behavior bylaw, issuing that letter, issuing perhaps that notice to comply, citing a breach of this bylaw might be enough to bring that resident into line. Now I know we are all at home, we are working, we are living, we are partying, perhaps we are frustrated, we are anxious, and noise is a huge problem in our buildings right now. I'm hearing from clients, I'm hearing from members inside our community about noise problems. We're seeing in the media, children playing on common property, children running through apartments. It's causing distress to other residents. We're used to being at work, we're not usually exposed to these kinds of noise to this kind of noise and this level of noise. You do have a noise bylaw, <coughs> excuse me. It is a fairly straightforward one. Again, it's an old model. You'll, you'll all have this bylaw. An owner or occupier of a lot or an invitee, a visitor to an owner or occupier of a lot must not create noise on a lot of the common property likely to interfere with the peaceful enjoyment of the owner or occupier of another lot or of any person lawfully using the common property very straightforward. It has been through the tribunal numerous times. I want to draw your attention to a particular case today, which gives us a bit of guidance, I think, on where this threshold is that we have to prove uh, unreasonable interference in particular, in order to prove a breach of the bylaw. And that's Andelman and Small. This is the citation here for you. This was a tribunal appeal panel case from March last year. Now, importantly, it's not a bylaw dealing with just noise. It's actually a bylaw about hard floors and noise that comes from hard floors. And I know from hearing from so many of you that this is often the source of a noise complaint. It's a hard floor. And you will have probably a bylaw about hard floors, which says something very similar to your noise bylaw. An owner must not, uh, or, an owner or their hard floors must not create noise sufficient to disturb the peaceful enjoyment of the neighbours that are below. That was the hard flooring or the flooring bylaw that was in Andelman. You'll notice it's very similar language to the noise bylaw that was just on your screen earlier. And what's important about this case is that the appeal panel, so the highest level of our tribunal, gave us some guidance about what it means to, to disturb the peaceful enjoyment of neighbours below. And it's not a very high threshold. The noise does not have to be excessive. It does not have to be more than normal living noise. It simply has to be sufficient to disturb the peaceful enjoyment of another. So central to these noise cases is the evidence that the disturbed resident, often the one below, the disturbed resident is able to produce about how their peaceful enjoyment is being impacted. That is really, really central. In the Andelman case, uh, she had a small child. Uh, she said, my son is, is just running back and forth. It is everyday living noise. This is not two in the morning. It's a small child uh, living in an apartment. And the tribunal member said, all that matters is, it doesn't matter if you tell me it's not excessive. It doesn't matter if you tell me that it's normal living noise. All that matters is this is noise that has disturbed the peaceful enjoyment of your neighbor. And I accept the evidence from the neighbor that their peaceful enjoyment has been disturbed. What is sufficient evidence will vary from case to case. It really depends on what is going on. Uh, of course, uh, I always say to clients, diary notes, journal entries, uh, a diary of the noise well kept over time 
I know it's painful, but over time is something that's going to be helpful if you can uh, pick up sound yourself through a sound recording that is helpful and ultimately an expert's report, especially if we're dealing with floors and allegations that floors are not properly soundproofed, an acoustic expert's report is going to be important. In this case, uh, Ms. Andelman was ordered to ensure that all floor space in her lot was covered or treated, that is soundproof, to an extent sufficient to prevent the transmission of noise likely to disturb the peaceful enjoyment of the lot below. So I wanted to give you that a uh, bit of a summary there about where the noise situation stands in our buildings, because I know so many of you are suffering or as committees, you're hearing about residents suffering and you may wanna arm them with some of this information. Uh, try to be patient if you can and understanding during these tough times. I know that is a lot to ask. Um, it is a really, really difficult situation for so many. Okay, before I head over to that question box, chat box, summary of my tips that I want to leave you with today, CCTV. If you have CCTV, fabulous. If you don't have it, think about it. It becomes incredibly easy to prove. Oh, prove bylaw breaches. If you have the culprit, the recalcitrant, as I keep saying on camera, uh, this is not about spying on people. People's behavior does change. If they know they are being watched so they don't commit the bylaw breach, they don't dump that rubbish in the wrong bin in the bin room if they know a camera is there. So it can be really, really helpful. I've mentioned seeking urgent interim orders, urgent orders if you need to stop work, that option is available to you. You probably wanna seek the advice of a strata lawyer if you're going down that path. There are certain circumstances where interim orders will almost certainly be issued and in others they're a little bit more tricky, but you do need to act quickly and it is that case of urgency where the committee would be entitled to seek legal representation without that ordinary resolution. I'm often asked, Amanda, if I win the tribunal case, do I get my costs paid if I'm paying a lawyer? Uh, sometimes <laughs> you need to prove that there are special circumstances. It is not like in a court where the winner simply gets their costs recovered. You have to apply for costs. Sometimes they're ordered, sometimes they're not. I always tell my clients to assume that they will not have their costs recovered even if they are successful. So be prepared for that. If you have a policy of insurance that may cover legal costs, a legal defense policy, tap into that. Too often I think strata managers, committee members forget that they have this policy. It's a really good one to uh, be reminded of if you are defending an application, if a lot owner has brought an application against you, the owner's corporation, tap into that defense policy. Uh, being engaged with your local council. Absolutely, uh, not just for events like this, but if there is a development that's going on, some building work that's being done that needs council approval, you think it needs council approval, alerting council to that so they may be able to help you by issuing an order, by telling the owner you can't do this. That's going to allow you then either to um, solve the problem, not go to the tribunal at all, or if you do have to go to the tribunal, going there with the support of the council or with the support of a council order in your back pocket is going to make your case so much easier. And I hope I don't sound like I have rose colored glasses on about this because I absolutely understand that this takes time, it takes persistence. We are all volunteers on our strata committees and doing the best we can. The fact that you are here today tells me that I'm preaching to the converted. You understand the difficult road that might be ahead, maybe not just road, a maze. I've got a maze there for you. I can show you the path. I can tell you or give you all of this knowledge and all of these tools, but I understand sometimes it does just feel like you're at the top of the ladder seeing the tricky maze that's ahead of you. You might have some questions. And I'm gonna head over now and answer as many of those as I can. I'm also gonna tell you where you can go if you're a Waverley Council resident to get some additional resources. This next slide has a couple of QR codes. We are QR code experts now. So I know you'll be able to snap these. Connect with Waverley Council for news, for programs, resources, for residents in apartment buildings. On the left there, you will be able to subscribe to the Sustainable Apartments e-newsletter. <clears throat> Don't panic if these are not working for you. There will be links in the follow-up email sent out by Waverley Council. On the right there, you can join the Sustainable Apartments private Facebook group, which I didn't realize was there until I joined it myself within the last couple of days. 
I also have a note here from council, which may answer some of these questions in the chat box. Yes, we will have the recording of this webinar to share with you and a copy of my slides. Okay, so I'll make sure I get a copy of my slides out to Waverley Council and you will have the content that has been on the slides with you after today's webinar. An email will be sent out by council. Alrighty, questions. Let's do this. I will stop sharing my screen. I'll come back to you here in the chat box to the many, many new messages. Now, as I said, I see some hands up. I'm not going to hands. I am looking in the chat box, which I'm just expanding. And if you don't mind me taking a sip, there's a lot of talking. <laughs> okay, a couple of questions up early on. Okay. I'm just, I saw a waste question early on. Yes, yeah, so Jen is saying throughout COVID, we've had so much more rubbish than we had before. Understandable. Can we get more bins to cope with the massive overflow? Great question, Jen. And I am aware that Waverley Council are able to do some additional collections for a small fee. Uh, if you're one of the council's officers may have answered you since you posted that question, but if you're in the Waverley local government area, do reach out to council. If you need an additional collection, I know that they're arranging that for some premises uh, and it's not expensive. So check that out and see if you can book that in. A uh, question about the recording. I knew it would be there. Yes, that will be coming through to those who have attended our webinar today. <clears throat> I've seen a couple of questions there about parking. So Anil has asked a question about parking and also Tanya has asked a question about parking. Um, didn't mention parking today, but absolutely you need a bylaw about parking, what the rules are with parking, what any restrictions are on visitors parking, and you need to enforce it. So this is where your CCTV becomes incredibly important. If you have a building manager, you're already steps ahead of those buildings that don't have building managers on site, able to monitor the use of parking areas. Uh, I see buildings all the time complaining about parking. And then I say, let me see your parking bylaw. That resident's clearly in breach of the bylaw. What's been done? Has a notice to comply been issued? Uh, have you proceeded on to the tribunal to seek a penalty order? Your bylaws are going to be abused. Your committee members, potentially your committee members are going to be abused. I know that happens too. Uh, if you don't set the standard and if you don't commit to upholding and enforcing your bylaws. Uh, I know a great building that has an excellent reputation for being tough, being tough on parking, being tough on bylaws, full stop. And you see over time, residents begin to understand mm, if I do that then I'm going to get one of those nasty notices I'm going to get one of those letters calling me to a directions hearing at NCAT I don't want that I don't want my landlord to be getting that so I'm going to fall into line and bad behavior breeds bad behavior so where you have tenants parking in the visitor parking when they shouldn't be other tenants seeing them do that other owner residents seeing them do that then the problem is just going to get worse it snowballs um, so that's the first thing that I say to people who are having uh, parking issues being able to um, enforce your bylaws is, and, and enforcing your bylaws, actually enforcing your bylaws is number one. Uh, scrolling back down through the hellos. Jeffrey is saying, once tenants become a majority in a strata building, there is a drop off in owner engagement. How can we better engage owners through often uncooperative letting agents? Yeah, great question, Jeffrey. Um, Look, I, I'm going to characterize this as you're, you're dealing with investor owners now. I imagine there's a lot of tenants. So you have non-owners, uh, no owners, no resident owners or a very small handful. Um, the way to get through to investor owners is to talk about money, talk about the bottom line. How can we improve the value of your investment? How do we improve the value of everybody's investment? And I talk about this a fair bit on the podcast because there's a benefit to this for your community, for those who are living there, and also for the owners who want their property to the investor owners who want their property to stand out when it's compared to the one next door, when it's compared to the one down the street, when it's compared to the one a couple of blocks over. They really have, even though they're not living there, they really do have, they may not realize it, so you have to tell them, but they have the same interest as others do in keeping that high standard in the community because they want to get the best 
uh, rental price. And ultimately, if they're thinking of selling, uh, they want to get the best price for their apartment when it comes to them comes to sell. So sending that message to them that if you're not engaged and if we're not making decisions, long-term decisions in the best interest of the building, like repair and maintenance, uh, like uh, welcoming all new tenants with an induction process, like enforcing the bylaws, then it's going to impact your property values down the track. Increasingly competitive market. In some areas, uh, we are there is high increased density, so there's more choice in some areas and buildings and investor owners should be much more focused on how they can get their property to stand out. So reminding our investor owners of that. As for contacting them, Jeffrey, the owner's name will be on the strata role. If you can get a copy of the strata role from your strata manager, or if you um, are able to, if you control the strata role. Uh, I appreciate that their... Um, Agents' details may be the point of contact. Uh, often strata roles will have two email addresses, so they will have the email address or a phone number for the um, owner. And also we now have to disclose, this is an interesting one just coming to me, Residential Tenancies Act now requires a contact for the owner, I believe. I'll let you know. I'll come back and let you know if I'm wrong. Uh, a contact for the owner to be on the lease. And the lease will very likely be in the owner's corporation's books and records. So a little bit of research and investigation to be done there, but I do think you, you can, if you are committed to the cause, find your owner, your non-resident owner details to communicate with them directly. I see Jen there saying, yes, illegal renovations. <laughs> uh, yes, they are a difficult one. Um, happy example there. I have worked with a building that uh, the owner did a renovation that was not in accordance with the approved bylaw. So there was a bespoke bylaw put forward by the owner for their renovation. They went ahead and, and completed it. The bylaw cleverly had a process where the committee could go in and have a look to make sure everything kind of looked like how it was supposed to look. And it was discovered that they had not done the renovation internal in accordance with the bylaw. And that committee issued an order that they uh, issued a, a letter requiring that the renovation be rectified and that common property be reinstated. There was no approval for that. Um, an opportunity was given for the owner to amend their bylaw and seek approval of the amended bylaw and therefore the illegal renovation get that retrospectively approved at a later general meeting guess what the majority of owners at that meeting said no they don't want to allow that renovation uh, in the current state that it's in because it wasn't in the best interests of the building so that amended bylaw was knocked down and then that committee proceeded with the enforcement process went to mediation mediation was unsuccessful the committee started to prepare the application for tribunal orders guess what the owner put their hand up and said, all right, we, get, we can give up now, we capitulate, we acknowledge our renovation is not done in accordance with the bylaw, we're now going to fix it. But that was a process and I had to go through that process and had to be tough and had to say, you know what, we're gonna, this is a bylaw that we wanted in place. The owner hasn't done this in accordance with the bylaw. We are going to commence the enforcement process. And hats off to them, that owner recognized that this committee was serious and said, all right, we better get this fixed. And I've seen other buildings that just let it go. They just let it go. So it's really, you guys really are in control. Okay, some really long sort of specific questions here, which unfortunately with the time today, I'm not going to be able to get to. Yes to a copy of the slides. Uh, I will just ask Elizabeth, if there are particular questions you're on top of in the chat there, Elizabeth, because there are so many that you'd love me to answer, feel free to open up mic and I will hear you read those out. Uh, Marcus is asking the new decision on dogs, will the Horizon Apartment decision hold up? Um, answer in my view is yes, it's a court of appeal decision and we now Marcus have that legislation I spoke about earlier. So if your building is banning animals, um, I don't think you're gonna be able to do that for much longer. Wow, so many, so many questions. Uh, Neil is asking, is the strata manager or strata committee permitted to refuse me a list of owners and their contact details, emails or phone numbers? So Neil, um, as I alluded to in answering the earlier question, owners are entitled to a copy of the strata role. 
So you are entitled to see whatever is on the strata roll. It will have a name of owners and it will have the contact details of owners. It is one of my pet peeves that strata managers or strata committees tell owners, no, you're not entitled to the strata role. You absolutely are. There is case law to that effect. It is a record of the owner's corporation. As long as you make your request in accordance with the legislation, section 183 of the Strata Schemes Management Act, they must deliver up, they, so not deliver up, but give you the opportunity to inspect the books and records. It must contain a full copy of the strata role. I've developed a template letter to send to strata managers who tell me no for privacy reasons. So I whip that template out quite regularly. Hi, Amanda, just jumping in here. Um, there was a question, if the rubbish is dumped by a tenant, can the landlord get reimbursed through the rental bond? To do that, the cost of rubbish removal will need to be attributed to that lot owner very quickly. Yes, so the short answer um, would be no through the rental bond. Um, the, so the owner, you're telling me that the owner is then paying for the cost of the rubbish removal. Um, I don't think it would be through, it may not be through the rental bond. Um, that would be a, a landlord tenant law question, not specifically a strata law question. So I don't want to wade um, where I'm not experienced. Um, but your, your owner paying the cost of the rubbish removal, there would be a, there, there may be a way, there may be a way. Um, I don't know if you have a thought on that, Elizabeth, uh, but it sounds to me like that's a question about between the landlord and the tenant as opposed to the building and the owner, which is what our bylaw goes to um, being able, the building, the owner's corporation, being able to recover the costs of its rubbish removal. If it has to remove rubbish and pay for it, it's got to get a private collection, it costs extra, the council won't do it, or it's on the common property, it's not on the public land. And if that causes the owner's corporation expense, then they can recover it from the owner of the lot responsible, whether it was the owner who dumped it or whether it was the tenant who dumped it. Because remember, our bylaw says that owners are responsible for the actions of their tenants and the costs can be recovered from the owner. Um, so unless, unless you wanna give me clarity on that, Elizabeth, I think that's as far as I can go with that one. Uh, hi, Amanda. That's not something we have explicit instructions on. We know that that is an avenue that has been pursued, whether or not that is um, something that would hold up. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I get, asked, I get asked a lot about whether we can withhold rental bond. Um, and my instinct in that, again, not having been, not practicing in that area, is that there's very limited circumstances where you can um, withhold parts of the rental bond. You can recover costs from your tenant for breach of the lease. Um, another really important reason to have this bylaw in place, owners corporations, so that it allows owners to say that their tenants have breached the bylaw. And I'd say that would be a condition in the lease that the, uh, that the tenant must comply with all bylaws. And if they breach bylaws, then they breach the lease. And maybe that opens up an avenue to recover rental bond. Um, so you really can't lose by having this kind of bylaw in place. Man, I have another question. Um, yeah, so this is from Jane. If the rubbish is dumped on public property, not the common property, is council now proposing to find the owner's corporation? Often the rubbish is dumped on the street, so not the common property. The owner's corporation will rarely know who exactly is responsible. Um, she fully supports making lot owners responsible. Too many landlords are overseas or interstate. So what would you say to that? Yeah. So the short answer to that is legally, yes. And a council can and always has. This bylaw doesn't regulate the relationship between council and the owner's corporation. It's about the owners corporation and the lot owners. Let me just make that clear. We're not changing the law here about what a council can and can't do. The local council has always been able to find owners corporations that is a legal entity for illegal dumping. And I've given, I've been engaged to give some specific advice to local councils on this in the past. And I've had a close look at the legislation. If the council can find out who is responsible for the dumping and that's always uh, the key issue. I know some councils have uh, cameras on the street and I've, I've lived in Waverley. I know that there's signs about the, ca the cameras on the street. So be aware of that. Uh, if the council can find out who is responsible, um, then they can send a notice and send a fine to that person. By person, I'm including owners corporation. The owners corporation can receive a fine if the dumping has come from that building. Now to your question about then sheeting that home to the responsible owner, um, having a look at what's in the rubbish, 
having a look at any personal details that might be there. People throw out all kinds of personal things, the letters, the bank statements. That could give you a pretty good idea of where the rubbish has come from. Uh, somebody's home. Uh, we're all home at the moment. Seeing this happen, seeing this happen. Uh, is there video evidence? Is there CCTV? Because if you've then got the bylaw in place, if you've got a fine from the council, what this bylaw does, it's, it doesn't allow council to fine you. Council's always had that. Right. What it allows you to do is pass on that fine to the owner responsible. Okay. So then you own, owners corporation are not wearing the fine. You're able to pass that on. You can only do that if you've got a bylaw. So remember I said passing on expenses is not otherwise legal under the act. You need a bylaw to allow you to do that. And the bylaw is going to put in place all of these rules that need to be followed by residents. And if they've gone and dumped on either the common property or on council land, it's not just a breach of council's requirements, it's a breach of your bylaw as well, so that you could enforce it, you can pass on that fine. Um, so don't be afraid to investigate rubbish. Uh, I come back to CCTV. Interject on that, just um, because there another avenue for um, certain councils and definitely Waverly Council is to report what you see with as much information as possible to RID online. I'm going to post the link for everyone there and I'll include it in the follow-up email. This is a specialist uh, squad that will investigate. Like you said, they'll look into the personal effects. Um, they work best with evidence. So if you see uh, removalists or something with a, a license plate, it may not even be coming from your property that happens. So in the, in the public domain, we have an ability to investigate and enforce and we've been doing you know, quite a, quite a bit of work there. So definitely pays to report. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It is good to know. Uh, we have, I can see in the chat, we've got our link there. Uh, so there was some trouble with the link. Uh, Pia says it's working. So I hope it is. If you haven't got it, it's coming through on the email, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to spend a few more minutes, Elizabeth, if you have some more questions there that you are burning for me to answer. Oh, I can see Jane's question now then. Excellent, mm. thank you, Jane. I see one from uh, Jenny. My neighbor refuses to use rubbish chute and leaves rubbish in the common area. The strata manager is unable to resolve <clears throat> and the managing agent disagrees it's littering. What can I do? The managing agent disagrees it's littering. Well, oh, I'd love to yeah. understand that thought process. Um, absolutely, That's, that is dumping on common property. And it is actually under the definition of our, in our bylaw, illegal dumping, because we give anything, any dumping that is in breach of the bylaw, we classify as illegal dumping and the bylaw can then be enforced. So that uh, resident, that tenant is in breach of the bylaw. Um, there may be costs associated for that cleanup to happen. You've got to pay your cleaners extra because they're having to deal with some common property dumping that is not otherwise part of their contract. And those costs can then be sheeted home, not just to the occupier, but to the owner. So getting that message through to the landlord owner that if you're going to have tenants in your property who behave this way, it's going to start to become expensive for you. You're going to have these kinds of costs added to your levy, added to your lot account, added to your levy account. That's what the bylaw allows you to do. So absolutely the bylaw could be enforced against that kind of behavior. Wonderful. Um, another question, do we issue penalty to the notices, I suppose, to tenants for breach or against the owner? Uh -huh. Very good question. And this depends on how cleverly your bylaws are drafted. Um, I recommend to clients now that when we're dealing with drafting bylaws that deal with behavior like noise, uh, rubbish, as I've done with this bylaw, um, your standard, um, yes, your noise and rubbish in particular, that you expressly make the owner responsible together with the resident. Okay. If you've done that in your bylaw, then you enforce the bylaw against both the owner and the resident. If your bylaw does not expressly make the owner responsible, then only the resident is responsible and only the resident gets the notice mm -hmm. because only the resident can be in breach. There is case law about that in respect of a noise issue where the building tried to draw in the landlord because of the tenant's noise and the landlord said, I ain't breaching the bylaw. Bylaw says nothing about me having to do anything at all. So being creative and careful about the drafting of your bylaws, yes, you can pursue both. And I know how helpful that is when you're dealing with uh, highly tenanted buildings to be able to draw in the owners because the tenants are coming and going. They may not get so far as a tribunal proceeding. Being able to draw in the owners is really important. Fantastic. I have one more question here. What are the implications to a strata committee if they are not enforcing their bylaws or not enforcing them consistently? Yes, this is an interesting one. Um, our legislation doesn't have an express duty 
for an owners corporation or a strata committee to enforce bylaws. However, we do have case law that says that an owners corporation that doesn't enforce the bylaws or enforces them sometimes for some people and not for other people. I know some of you out there will be like, yep, Amanda, we have committees like that. If it's somebody's friend, a blind eye is turned. And if it's not, then the notice to comply arrives. There is case law that says that kind of a strata committee may well be dysfunctional. And we know in a community, if there is dysfunction, then an administrator can be appointed, a compulsory managing agent can be appointed and all power of the strata committee and of the owners corporation transferred over to that, that administrator. So what I'd say is failure to enforce bylaws when clear, there are clear breaches and committees have been asked to enforce bylaws. So you, you as an owner can put forward a motion at a general meeting that the committee enforce bylaw number six against lot two, put the motion forward, motion fails, you can't get it up. It is a sign of dysfunction. And you would then be saying to your committee, hey, you're at risk of losing your power, all your power and all your authority if you're dysfunctional because the tribunal can appoint an administrator. Um, so that's where I'd say that one goes. I have another uh, question for you. If somebody leaves shoes, and I've, I've seen this also um, asked about things like uh, strollers or prams, um, at the front door to the unit, is that considered dumping? It is entirely up to the community how they deal with that. In some buildings, that's going to be acceptable. And in other buildings, it's just not. So the bylaw doesn't expressly deal with those items, but it is given to you in a word version. So you can change your definition of uh, waste. It would come under the definition of waste. Um, it really depends on the layout of the building. I know in my building, there are some apartments that are right there opposite the lift. So it's quite easy. If somebody's put things out the front, it's not looking very nice. There are other apartments that are just by themselves around a corner. Um, so putting something out the front, absolutely no one is going to see it. So I think you need to approach that on a building by building basis. Um, and really that's about changing the external appearance of the lot. So you will have bylaws already in place. Think about this. Um, I think it was model bylaw 17 years ago. Um, an owner can't change the external appearance of their lot. Um, so is that what's going on there? Maybe you've already got a bylaw there that you can enforce in appropriate circumstances. So just be, be reasonable about that one. Uh, I'm seeing lots and lots of thank yous come on through the chat here. Uh, I have gone on longer than we planned. Uh, and Elizabeth, unless you have uh, something to jump in with before I wrap up. I'm uh, look, I think we've we've covered off the ones that I think will um, benefit the most folks and uh, the most uh, waste focused. So I'm hoping everyone is just keen to get that bylaw and uh, start implementing it. You know where to head. And if you didn't grab that link, you will be getting an email from Waverley Council with the links to the resources that I have mentioned. I have loved enjoy and love spending this afternoon with you all, even though we're home alone, some of us and locked down. Uh, it's wonderful to feel that I'm in the presence of hundreds of you here on this webinar. And I'll look forward to doing it again sometime soon. Thank you very much, Waverley Council. All look after yourselves and look after each other as we have such great opportunity to do in our apartment buildings right now. And I will catch you next time. See you everyone. Thanks Amanda.